Hi guys, in this video I'm going to analyze the fantastic game played in round 5 of the FIDE candidates. It's Pragnananda playing with the white pieces against Jan Nepomnici. But before I'm going to delve into this uh, fantastic game, few things to, to say. First of all, apologies for the uh, delay in uh, recording and uploading this uh, video. But I got a good excuse. I had a 12-hour uh, flight. I just got back home. And the first thing I did before unpacking my luggage is opening up my computer and analyze this game. So here we go. Um, I think this is just a fantastic game you don't want to miss. But one other very exciting thing, uh, at least for me personally, is that the channel is now uh, one year online. It's exactly one year since the first video had, has been uh, published. So that is a nice uh, milestone, but we are not stopping here yet. It's just the beginning. But one little favor, guys. If you want to give me a small gift by subscribing to the channel, I really appreciate all the support. It really motivates me to keep on going and cover the most exciting games played uh, out there. So now back to business. It is Pragnananda opening the game with the move 1e for Napo. Goes for e5, knight f3. And now knight f6. This is the uh, Petrov defense. And since a few years, it is uh, Napo's main repertoire against 1e4. He has been playing it in his uh, World Championship match against Magnus Carlsen in uh, Dubai 2021. And the players are following that uh, line for a couple of moves. Because after knight takes e5, d6. The knight goes back to f3. Knight takes e4, d4, d5. Bishop d3, and here bishop d6. This is uh, kind of an uh, aggressive system. There are quite a number of uh, sharp lines uh, out there. There are also other ways of playing, including bishop e7, knight c6, or even bishop f5. But bishop uh, d6, that's the move Napo is uh, a big fan of. Castling kingside by both sides. White plays here the move c4, challenging the pawn on d5 to undermine the knight on e4. Black goes for the move c6, and here... Magnus Carlsen played in this uh, match with Napo the move rook e1. It's one of the two main options. The other one here is uh, knight c3. And of course, there are also quite a number of, uh, of other possibilities. Knight c3 is very interesting. And uh, Napo has a lot of experience with it. So you can imagine that Prague had prepared something very special for this occasion. Knight takes c3, b takes c3. And after d takes c4, bishop takes c4. Looks like black is very solid here. Um, white is having these uh, hanging pawns in the center. But white's also having quite some nice um, piece development. And uh, black's pieces on the queen side, they're still not uh, doing that much. So here, after the move bishop f5, Prague played the move bishop g5, attacking the queen. The queen goes to a5 to hit the pawn on uh, c3. But the main continuation here is this move knight to h4, putting pressure against the bishop on f5. But so far, so good. Everything is well-known opening theory. And here, this move uh, bishop e6, offering the exchange of light squared bishops. However, black's main plan is that after bishop takes e6, you're not going to recapture that, uh, that bishop, but instead you capture the other bishop on g5. So now both the knight and the bishop are under threat, but the knight comes back to f3. The knight is saved, hits the queen. The queen goes back all the way to a5. And here the bishop on uh, e6 got to move. In a lot of games, people played here this move, bishop to, uh, to b3. It looks like the bishop is very nicely placed on this diagonal, eyeing the pawn on uh, f7 putting pressure on black's uh, king. But the move bishop h3, small surprise, but Napo is, uh, is well prepared for it. In fact, there are just a few games played with this line. And one game was uh, one between uh, Ralf Mamadov, strong grandmaster from Azerbaijan, against Jan Nepomnici, uh, played on chess.com. In that game, Napo just dropped back with the queen to c7. But in these sort of positions, white... Is probably a bit better thanks to that nice little uh, space advantage in the center. But let's go back because instead of dropping back to c7, you can also take the pawn on c3. 
And that is, uh, that's a critical move, just capturing the pawn. But what is White's idea here? Well, Prague goes for the move, rook b1, hits the pawn on b7. Would be great for White if he can just uh, win the pawn back immediately. And then the rook is excellently placed on the, on the seventh rank. But here b6 is played. And now the second idea behind White's last move is rook b3 to attack the queen. And the queen has only two squares to go to, either c4 or a5. Well, queen a5 looks like the, the safest uh, square for the queen. You're also attacking the pawn on a2. You're preventing this bishop from getting back into the game to f5 as the queen is covering that uh, square. But look here, this is where modern opening preparation is starting. We are on move 19, but White played here this. Amazing move, d4, d5, sacrificing a second pawn. One of the main ideas behind this move, of course, is that if you do take with the queen, well, there is the move rook to d3 with an attack on the queen. If the queen goes away, the bishop on d6 is going to be captured. So that is not possible. Instead, here, black decided to play the move c takes d5. Black is two pawns up, but where is White's compensation for, for this material? Well, look what Prague had in mind here. He goes for the move knight g5. This is the idea when uh, sacrificing the pawn on uh, d5. Now the fifth rank has been uh, blocked by that pawn and the knight on g5. Maybe it's not clear yet what it's doing there, but you see, the queen will come to h5, threatening checkmate on h7 the bishop can come to f5 as well and with his rook on b3 swinging the rook over to the king side is also a very thematical plan for uh, for white so obviously black should react here and um, here napo has been investing quite a lot of time played here the move h6 but pragnananda still in his home preparation and being an hour up on the clock Uncork the following stunning peace sacrifice. Look now what's happening, guys. Knight takes f7. What on earth is happening here? You're sacrificing the peace. Well, if you do take with the rook, the bishop comes in to, uh, to e6, pinning the rook on f7. And you have ideas like queen h5, rook f3 coming next. Even bishop takes d5. With the idea to uh, to trap the rook in the corner is just looking incredibly strong. So you better don't take with the rook. But instead, Napo played uh, the move. King takes f7. He captured with the king. But now, where is the, the main plan? Now, the deep preparation is being revealed as Prak goes for the move. Rook d3. Very slow move, but very strong threat as you're intending to take on d5 with an attack on the queen and the bishop on d6 white is about to regain the piece and well even though you may be one or two pawns down it's still clear that black's king is very exposed now so let me show you a couple of ideas if for instance if you try to get your knight into the game with something like knight to uh, to a6 there is something like rook takes d5 and there is a double attack on the queen and the bishop. And if you put a bishop on c5 trying to defend against both threats, now incredibly strong is this move. Queen b3 and the king is caught in the middle of the board. Can't really escape to g8 because it runs into discovered attack on the queen. Discovered check winning the queen on a5. If you try to escape with king g6, queen d3 check. King f7, and now beautiful idea for white here is the move queen h7. So the king can never get back to a safe place. Rook f5 is an idea to hit the king, to take on g7. White is completely winning here. So knight a6 is not a convenient way to uh, complete your uh, development. And well, black got to think about other ideas. But for instance, if you try to run back with your king to uh, g8, now, rather than taking this pawn on d5 with your rook, because bishop c5 is still there, you do give a check on e6. If the king goes to h8, there is bishop takes d5. The rook in the corner 
is hanging, can't go anywhere. If you move your knight, white is gonna take the rook anyway. And then after that, the bishop on d6 is uh, hanging as uh, as well. So there are a lot of problems here for uh, black to uh, to solve. And being confronted with this powerful uh, novelty, it's not an uh, easy task here for Napo. But he came up with an incredible idea as he played here this move, knight to d7. Why do you put your knight on that square? Well, the knight can be taken. But after bishop takes d7, king to g8. The king is relatively safe. And now these ideas with bishop e6 and taking on d5, they are less impressive because the rook is able to move away. Also, something like rook takes d5, you're not going to take with the queen, of course. But you put your bishop on uh, on c5 in, uh, in that case. And black is still alive and uh, the king is okay. So... That is the idea, but Prak had prepared for uh, had, had prepared for this uh, best uh, move by Black Knight d7. Decided to take here with the rook on d5, and everything is hanging: the queen and the two minor pieces on the d file. So, what is uh, happening here? Well, Knight c5 is a logical move to give back the material, but in hindsight, Black better should have taken on. Um, on h2. After king takes h2, then you put your knight on c5. And apparently you're just back. Uh, you're just in time to uh, evacuate your king. For instance, rook d6, king g8. Now, if you do give a check on d5, you put your king on h8 and everything is still sort of uh, okay. You get a sort of better version of the game because the pawn on h2 is, uh, is no longer there. But let's get back. Because what happened here? After rook takes d5, Napo played the move knight c5. Very logical move. I mean, when you're under pressure, normally you don't get this opportunity to uh, to take a pawn. It's, uh, it's usually not a good idea. You would rather try to catch up uh, with your development, try to find good squares for your pieces to consolidate your position. Rook takes d6, king g8, queen to d5. Check. Now the king doesn't really want to go to h7 because then uh, their bishop comes into the attack with tempo. So the king instead goes to h8. And here we are, guys. This is a big moment in the game. Big moment in the tournament because Prak is, objectively speaking, winning here. And he knows that he is still in his preparation or very close to it. He knows that Nepal had made his uh, mistake by uh, playing knight c5 immediately. He started to think here and played here an, uh, a logical move, bishop uh, f5. But it's, it's way too slow. You don't have time to get your uh, bishop into the attack. And black responded here with a beautiful move, knight to b7, offering the exchange of queens. Because if you take the knight, there's queen takes f5 and black is out of the woods. Also, after the uh, game's continuation, queen takes a5, knight takes a5, white is better, but it's it's very minimal. It's uh, not clear if white has serious winning chances here at all. But let's go back. Before I'm going to show you what happened um, in the game after the queens came off the board, I want to show you what white should have done here. Because what you have to sense is that you are super active with your major pieces. You're dominating the center. And with a move like queen e5, you're able to impose new threats. You're pinning the pawn on g7. So white has a strong threat of taking on h6. If you go away with the king to, uh, to g8, then it's rook to g6. And you are threatening mate uh, on uh, g7. Uh, as both the queen and rook are attacking that pawn. If you defend, now the key idea is to take on g7 anyway. Rook sacrifice, but on the next move, you are going to win back the rook in the corner. And of course, uh, you still have to convert it, but black's king is wide open. The bishop will be able to join soon as well. So it's technically winning. So after queen e5, maybe Prague didn't, Play this move because he felt that after queen takes a2, things are not that simple. If you take the pawn on h6, the king goes to g8. And if you move the rook now to g6, renewing the mating threat, well, the queen comes back to f7 to hit the rook to defend against the mating threat. 
and it's it's totally unclear. The knight co is covering the e6 square, so the bishop is unable to to come there either. And uh, okay, if you're not going to deliver mate, don't forget that black is having uh, two outside passed pawns on the queen side. But instead of taking the pawn on h6, and I think this is the 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 really hard part. Uh, it's that you you can start here with uh, with bishop f5. This is a really really nice move, as now the the threat of rook takes h6 is much stronger. Let's say if you do play queen f7, you take on h6, king g8, and here after bishop h7, you force the king to go back to h8. You go bishop g6. You're already winning the queen. But even cooler is to sacrifice your rook and not take the queen and just deliver checkmate on h7. So. That is the, the big impact the, the bishop is having here in this uh, in this game. If it rejoins play, it's going to be made very soon. However, the line continues after bishop f5. If you play the most stubborn move here as black, which is the move king to, uh, to g8, well then, um, this brilliant idea for white is to drop back with the bishop to b1, to gain the tempo, to hit the queen. The queen goes away, and now... Another absolutely insane move has to be found now for, for white. Um, because what you want to do as white is threaten checkmate on h7. Set up a battery with queen and bishop. But all these squares have been taken away by, uh, by the knight and the queen. So the key move for white here is queen b2. And even here things are not, not uh, that clear. But the engine is really evaluating it as completely winning. For uh, for white, uh, the, the plan is uh, queen c2 with mating threat on h7, also bishop a2. So multi-purpose move of dropping back with both your bishop and the queen. This is so counterintuitive, but uh, it, it, it really shows how important it is to, to get that bishop involved. Well, back to the game, um, there followed this move bishop f5, as I said. And then knight b7 is this great idea. Queens are coming off the board, knight takes a5. The bishop on f5 is threatened to be taken, so therefore g4 played. But now the knight comes back from the side. It comes now to the to the center. It hits the rook on d6. Uh, white moves the rook away. You could put the rook on uh, d4, but then black is going to advance the pawn to b5 to, to protect the knight. So rook d5 is played to prevent black from establishing a grip um, on the queen side for the knight. Uh, but here I, I like the, the way... Napo um, neutralized White's uh, small edge here by by playing the move Rook AE8. You're trying to um, uh, to uh, gain control of the E5 square, so the, so that the Knight is uh, coming back to the King side. White played here the move H3. Knight E5 played anyway. King to G2, G6, so that uh, you're attacking the Bishop. The Bishop uh, goes away. And uh, now uh, black play the move g5. So you're controlling the f4 square. The knight is, uh, is stable here. The bishop can go back to, uh, to f5, but that is not a problem. Because with the move rook e7, uh, black is uh, consolidating its position. Uh, it can always double uh, the rooks on the e-file to, uh, to support the knight. And also after rook d6, white is hitting the pawn on h6. King comes to g7, defending the pawn. And after rook e1, the rook comes to f6. So all the threats have been parried. Rook goes back to d5, attacking the knight on e5 twice. So knight goes to g6, getting out of that pin and offering the exchange of rook. So here, knight takes e7, uh, sorry, rook takes e7, knight takes e7, rook d7, pinning the knight on e7. The king goes back to f8. And well, if you take on a7, there is knight takes f5 and we get a rook end game with three pawns each, which is... And, uh, a dead uh, draw. In the game, instead of taking on a7, white played here to move bishop to e4 first, keeping the bishop on the board, threatening to take the pawn on a7. But black can play a5, and now both the pawns on b6 and h6 are well defended. So there's absolutely no way white is able to make progress. Also, the rook is fantastically placed on the f-file so that the king is uh, cut off. And after king g3, the knight goes to g6. The knight is ready to... Uh, just install itself on uh, f4. Bishop takes g6. Rook takes g6. Now it's a rook end game. Um, h4 on the board. Rook c6. Black is ready to, to become active. To give checks or, or win the pawn on a2. And after takes takes. Rook b7. 
Uh, the move A4 is played, but White is absolutely unable to make progress here. So the players on move 44 agreed to a draw. But this is a really big moment in the in the tournament because with this draw, uh, Napo. Uh, retains the lead. Now uh, Gukesh won his game, so he's sharing the lead with uh, another Indian player, Gukesh and Nepal, both on three and a half out of five. But this is a painful uh, draw for uh, Prague, who had fantastic home preparation. I mean, Nepal is always playing this line. He may have prepared this for months, this idea, waiting it, waiting to, to employ it against Nepal in this game. And then such a big opportunity to strike was missed by the by the young uh, Indian uh, player. Uh, let's see how he copes with this uh, setback. He's still on two and a half out of five. Nine more rounds to go, so anything can happen. But this is a moral uh, victory for uh, for Nepal, who is still in the lead, as I said. And uh, in round six, he's playing against his uh, one of his main rivals, Fabiano Caruana. So let's see what's going to happen in uh, in that game and other games in this uh, tournament. Thanks for watching this video, and remember. To celebrate this uh, first anniversary, just hit the subscribe button and uh, you make my day even, uh, even nicer. So thanks for doing that and see you in the next videos.